Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for joining. Let me just share my screen and let's get going. So <clears throat> this session is about secure supply chain. I'm Matteo. I'm the head of software engineering from Avanad UK and Ireland. I'm also Microsoft MVP for Azure DevOps and GitHub. And I spend a lot of time day to day trying to discuss why it's important to have a secure supply chain, why security is not just about managing your code, why it's important having all of these precautions directly in your um, toolchain. So <clears throat> let's start with, with something, right? Let's start with something that gives you an idea. Let me just take this down if I can. Uh, right. So it's important to think that DevOps is, in my view, and none of them rounds, the union of people, process, and products to ensure continuous delivery of value to the end users of our products. Now, when we talk about value, it's about anything that makes a difference from the user's point of view. So anything that you can bring that brings a betterment or a bug fix or anything that will change people's experience with your product. Whenever it comes to security, we usually think of you know, things that will have a tangible impact in terms of bugs, in terms of precautions, in terms of things that you can uh, prevent or secure on their data. <clears throat> However, the reality is that more often than not, we talk about reactive fixes, right? <clears throat> so think about it. In many organizations, many people do penetration tests like once a year, you will get a fat uh, analysis report, something will be done, time will be spent, but then nothing will actually happen. This is because every time you change something and you fix an unexpected behavior, especially when it comes to security, but not exclusively, you end up in this situation where the cost of fixing a certain bug has got a different price. And this is, I mean, this is about time, right? So this is a relative cost based on time. But in essence, we are talking about actual tangible cost which is based on the time of action. So when it comes to a fix that happens in the requirements phase, then that fix will be uh, easier and cheaper to ship compared to something that happens in production. Now, anytime we talk uh, about this scenario, then we have an actual euro or dollar sign attached to it, right? So when it comes to this, if you find something here, when you're defining your requirements, then it's obviously going to be cheaper to fix because if the expectation is, you know, uh, I'm doing, I need something that goes up and all the expectations are around a rocket and in reality, the requirement was to deliver just a lift, an elevator, then obviously it's going to be cheaper here. Imagine if you find out after you deliver the rocket that is obviously way more expensive. Now, this is an extreme example, but at the same time, it is something that <clears throat> explains how we, uh, how we do things, right? It explains how we pay for our bug fixes. And when it comes to security, those things are hidden, right? So it's very, very important to start considering security in your requirements from the get-go. It's not just about code, but it's also about your dependencies. When you have an application and your application is gonna use any form of dependency, it's very important to consider threat modeling, to consider how your application and how your service is gonna have dependencies, which can cause a security threat. Now, I'm sure many of you heard about the left pad a library that wrote, uh, you know, caused a lot of problems in the past. It was a simple JavaScript library, <clears throat> but that library, all they did was shifting left some text. What happened is that that library disappeared overnight from NPM and it broke hundreds of websites, hundreds of applications because it was so used for doing something very simple. However, nobody has ever paid attention to the threat analysis of that and making sure that the risk profile was appropriate. Now in that case, it was just a library that disappeared. So yes, there were, you know, there were issues but they were related to something uh, vanishing overnight. Now imagine if a library gets replaced <clears throat> with something else that's got some malicious, you know, some malicious code in there, some malicious vectors, which might be a vehicle for introducing it to your network or compromising your application. That is something that any team 
should start considering from the get-go. So whenever people start talking about security, it's extremely important that it's not just about the code that gets written, but also the type of dependencies that we introduce and the external services as well. Obviously, secure calling practices are extremely important and solutions should always emerge directly from the team, but sometimes it's good to introduce uh, a layer of control. A typical example of this is secrets management. Now, I don't have anybody from the audience in front of me, but at the same time, I would ask how many people has ever got or come across secrets, so usernames, password, tokens, SSH keys, anything like that, whichever went into a code repository. And I'm sure that there will be at least a few hands in the audience. Now, the reason why it's a very important question is because whenever you put anything in a version control system, even if you remove it afterwards, that something still exists. That something is always available, right? Because by definition, <clears throat> with a version control system, it's been versioned. So using something like a key vault in Azure or a vault or some other equivalent uh, secret storage technologies is gonna prevent this situation from happening because otherwise you always be catching up and you always be pruning your code base. Now, in this case, a secret, whatever that is, is always identified by a hash and it will always have a secret value stored into the system. Now, in order to retrieve this, you will have to use the Key Vault APIs or any form of integration that leverages the Key Vault APIs. Now, what is really interesting is that <coughs> with a tool like Azure DevOps, you can then link your secret directly into a variable group or into any form of variable management, which is going to automatically get and manipulate the secrets for you so that you don't have to worry about storing those secrets anywhere besides a place where it's designed to contain secrets. So in this case, if I'm storing the key uh, over here in, Azure, in Acme Key Vault, I will map it into key in Azure DevOps. It will have no expression in this case because this is a simple demo, but the reality is it's always going to be available and it's always going to be retrieved directly from Key Vault, as you can see over here. Interestingly enough, many of the threats that we talk about in this day and age are external. So as I said, we need to monitor our supply chain. We need to monitor what we use and what we interface with. We'll go back to the secrets management uh, situation in a second, but think about it, right? Your application, your code, it's easy to manage, it's easy to patch, and it's easy to improve because you have full control over your dependencies. You know what, you, what you're building, you know the whole domain and the whole set of requirements behind the code that was built. Now, when it comes to both external services and implicit dependencies, you don't have this luxury. The reason is that the implicit dependencies could be something that is provided via NPM or Nugget or anything else that provides you with the packages. What's very important is that you don't know who your suppliers are or why your suppliers are doing certain things. So think about something heavily used as jQuery. Like jQuery used to be used a hell of a lot. You go to jQuery and if someone, for whatever reason, manipulates jQuery, you have an external open source dependency, which is compromised, which is heavily used, and that many people can actually leverage to get into your application or to compromise your application. This is a big security problem, right? And that is why secure supply chain should address this because in an, in an ideal world, you should vet all of your dependencies. Same story with the external services. How essential are your services? Because in this case, it's not as much a security problem, but rather something that will prevent your application from working. Imagine, you know, in an extreme example, you might be using an external service to perform a mundane yet very important activity like keeping track of time. Now, what if this external service disappears? If you are doing something that relies heavily on time tracking, that external service disappearing is gonna cause you a lot of problems and it's gonna break your application. This is not just a security problem, but also a fundamental functional problem, right? 
So anything here is easy because you control it. Anything here is hard because it can break your application. Anything here is hardest because this can have a direct influence on your application without you noticing. So if something happens to the external services, you will have an outage, but chances are nothing will really happen. If you have a problem with your implicit dependencies, then it's a big, big problem. So in the modern world, in the modern engineering world, there are some tools that can help. And the key is that they both need to be unattended and transparent. You don't wanna cause any overhead. You don't wanna cause any direct issue to your development teams so that they will have to spend time uh, directly on implementing new tools and, impl and changing the ways they work and all of that. It's extremely, extremely important. And the first example, we'll go back to secrets, is to have something that automatically performs secret scanning. Very, very important because if this is injected in every pipeline that you run, in any automation that you run, then obviously it's going to be easy for you to detect and intercept things that will go wrong. So once you have that in place, you will safely be able to say that you don't have secrets stored and that repository is considered secure. Very, very important. If you don't use something like that, I would strongly encourage you to do it. There are a number of tools in the market. Over here, I use QuetScan just as an example, but there are so many things that you can use. What's really important is that failures will be generated if there are secrets and possibly a report in case there are findings. The other very important matter is to have a solid quality code quality analysis platform in place. Because yes, you will have code standards with, uh, with your developers, they should all be agreed, but then it's very important to enforce these code standards. And tools like SonarCube and Q1 and so on, they are extremely important when it comes to enforcing those uh, baselines and standards because it needs to be automated. You need to have something that runs every time you run a CI build that is going to scan your application and makes it, uh, you know, it highlights problems so that the code base remains maintainable. It's very, very important and it ensures longer term sustainability of your code. Now, SonarCube does a degree of um, supply chain scanning. <clears throat> as you can tell, uh, it will look at your application as a whole and it's going to also look at what are the vulnerabilities and uh, what could be the security hotspots. Now, all of these are, however, on the whole code base. So there is no specific uh, distinction between your code and other code. What's really interesting is when you enter the world of supply chain analysis. So your code is secure, your code is fine, but what happens to your dependencies? It's very important because what, like we discussed, uh, a dependency can be a big problem. A dependency can be a, a cause for concern and it could be a big security exposure. It's not just about security vulnerabilities themselves, but also the status of these dependencies. So if they are up to date and if the licensing is compliant, because yes, security issues, of course, but also legal issues if you're using something that's not, um, that's not licensed properly. And this is an example from a tool uh, called uh, Vault. It is from a snap, an older screenshot where it's it posed the name uh, white source, uh, but in reality, this is now called MEND. This tool is going to scan all of your bill and it's going to give you not just the security vulnerabilities that you can see over here with the list of relevant CV and obviously the library that they are referred to, but also a score based on all the libraries as well as the license distribution that is used. So if there is something like GPL, that could be an issue in certain situations. Otherwise, it's going to be about the license and the security vulnerability. Interestingly enough, this gives you the CVE that the vulnerability is referred to, what is the top fix, and what's the description of the issue. Something similar is done by a tool called Snick. It runs, again, independently. It is unattended and it connects to your uh, development platform. So you can go in and you can have a look at what the code is and what the dependencies are. Now, if we look at this, we're quickly gonna go out from PowerPoint and onto Snick proper. 
this is an example, right? This is an old sample project and it's not really relevant in terms of code base. However, what's really interesting is that SNCC is gonna look at the runtime that I'm using. For example, in this case, I'm using an old version of .NET Core, which is vulnerable to remote code execution. So very, very important uh, to fix because I know that uh, this has got an exp um, a mature exploit that can be leveraged. There is a suspected denial of service um, exploit that could be used on MVC. However, there's no known exploit for this. It's just based on the analysis of ASP.NET Core MVC, other libraries as well. But interestingly enough, rather than just looking at the libraries and the, uh, and the runtime, if you look at something like this, which is new to JSON, you will see that this is an external library, which is used within secure defaults. And what really matters is that Newton's of JSON is used by another library that I'm using in my application called launch.client. And this is indirectly introducing a problem into my code base. This is an extremely interesting scenario because I'm not directly using Newton's of JSON. However, I am introducing it with a third party library. And in this case, it's gonna tell me everything. So it's gonna be introduced via this library uh, at this version. There's no remediation path as far as we're aware, and you just have to update the original library that's using it. Also, there is a proof of concept or an explanation of how to exploit this uh, vulnerability, which means that it's pretty mature. This is really interesting because it doesn't just look at what the, the issues are, then it will also provide you with suggested fixes, but it's also going to give you how you are introducing those problems. So if you look at the original example, here we are introducing potential issues in the runtime by an extension that comes from Visual Studio. This is again contained within uh, the runtime itself. But aside from that, it's very important to understand how to fix this and where they're coming from. If you want to fix them, then you can open a pull request and Zlink is going to do the need for you. So you're going to create a pull request that is connected directly with your uh, development experience, with your development platform. And from there, you're going to be able to just open up your, oh, in this case, it's space because it's built to process back the framework. It's fairly old code base. But at the same time, it's, it's that simple, right? It's just behind the button. The other interesting thing, as soon as it loads back, it is that it's going to provide you with the dependencies list, right? And this is very important. Now, in this particular case, there's nothing which is absolutely major over here, as you can see. But in a real world scenario, oh, actually, yes, there is, because you see an old version of the runtime and so on. So you will have a list of all the issues which are available per dependency based on the paths that they're invoked. If I go and look at the dependency per se, I can go and have a look and say, okay, those are the known vulnerabilities that I can see, right? And this is the reason why this is vulnerable. Now, this is obviously for the runtime. So the easiest path would be, uh, would be just to update the runtime to a newer version. But sometimes it's not about runtime. So if we look at, again, users of JSON, I will find it. And there it is. The, this is the only vulnerability that was reported. If you look at other things like extensions, you will see that there are none. If you look at the JSON formatters, this comes, uh, this comes directly from ASP.NET via Nugget. You can see that there's this number of things for which it's vulnerable for, and those are reported there. There's also more. If we go back to the slide decks, we can talk about Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Now, this has been just re released in uh, preview, but it does something very similar to SNCC. However, directly integrated with your Azure tenant and your um, DevOps estate, right? So <clears throat> you can connect both GitHub and Azure DevOps, it's going to scan everything, and then it's going to give you code scanning vulnerabilities, as open source vulnerabilities, etc. Now, if we if we look at it, sorry, if we look at it, and we go back to again the the live environment once again, this is interesting for one very specific reason. If you are using Azure DevOps or GitHub already, this is very much integrated with your development platform. And it is completely transparent yet, inter yet sorry, aggregated, showing everything coming out of this data. Now, 
<clears throat> it does everything at face value. So it does code scanning, it does exposed secrets or open source vulnerabilities and then recommendations per se. And it does it across all the organization as your DevOps or all the um, organization again in GitHub. It will provide you with recommendations which are very, very powerful. And if I open up something like this, which is an old project, you will see that the recommendation is fairly simple. You should have secret scanning findings and a result. This is something that you can then explore and understand why it's important, what is the tactic used, what is the remediation. Now, in this case, you can also either take the action and say, okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna fix it. Don't worry about it, I will consider it fixed and so on. Or you can trigger a logic app. So it's gonna rescan. Uh, the whole thing and then the results will trigger an update of uh, this criteria. The other very interesting thing is that you can have alerts directly integrated with Azure and you can also <clears throat> you can also use the recommendations like I said. So if I look at the recommendations that are available, I can just open it up and say okay what, what are the recommendations for DevOps explicitly? Well they're going to be blended in into the defender recommendations at all but you look at vulnerabilities, for example, and you will have code repositories uh, available over here. You will go and look at, uh, for example, security best practices. And here you will have things which would be flagged in terms of uh, access directly on your code base and so on. So there's a number of things that will be done as part of Defender. And this is interesting because it covers both Azure DevOps and GitHub as first class citizens in an integrated experience with the possibility of remediating. If I look at the DevOps workbook, which is what runs behind the scenes, then I will also be able to add other things over time. Now, obviously right now, this is just a preview. So it's a very early days and it is something that has been developed. However, it will be extended with other workbooks and we will be able to add more solutions to it uh, in, the, in the near future. What's really interesting as well is the high level view, right? If you compare it with Snake, for example, and you go on the dashboard for Snake, you don't really have a high level view of what is going on. You will know that you have a current state, you have a number of current security issues, but then you, you will have the projects front and center. And I can tell you that it is in the real world, you go in and you say, okay, project by project, show me what's going on, show me the issues, and let's have a look at what, what we can do. So for example, over here, for high high level issues, this is going to be relatively straightforward to fix, of course, and that's where uh, people will be dragged along. The difference with Defender for Cloud is that this is done at project level, okay? So this is not done at sing sorry at, at um, project as organizational projects in Azure DevOps, sorry, so as team project. This will be done at, at team project level, which means that you will have access to all the repositories inside a team project. And that's where things will, be, will become interesting because you will get a score, which is based on the sum of the vulnerabilities inside there, which is really, really interesting. So it's done at team project level. And you can see that we have 99 repositories at the moment scanning as your DevOps and four in GitHub. <clears throat> There's more to it, of course. And it is why it, it, it's a very interesting, and very important topic. There's more to it because we talked about secure supply chain, we talked about the dependencies. However, it's also very, very important to validate your infrastructure. I also see that we have a question in the meantime. So before I go on, I will answer the question. So how would you compare Snyk and Defender for Cloud when it comes to in-depth analysis or possible false positive? Brilliant question. So I'm gonna answer this live, of course, but um, the question is brilliant because Snyk is a platform that does way more than just doing supply chain. So there's artificial intelligence behind the scenes. There's a number of things that Snyk can do also on the developer side. So there's gonna to be toolings available from Snyk, which will allow developers to run validations on the client side and they will be able to prevent pushing issues. In Defender for Cloud, however, this is explicitly something that will happen at a single pane of glass view. So it's always a monitoring exercise at the minute rather than something that the developers will own directly. This is the biggest difference. With Snake, you will have a tool that you can run on your client with Defender for DevOps, you don't. So you have to rely on the scanning and then the remediation. So back to the infrastructure. The very interesting matter about the infrastructure is that 
you will be able to hide potentially security risks inside your infra. How? Well, even not willingly, right? So if you use uh, extensions when provisioning Azure resources, that's obviously a potential risk because you might be introducing a third party extension. If you're running any script, which happens uh, at infrastructure deployment time, that could be a risk, as well as potential settings that you might introduce, which cause problems. <clears throat> and this is very, very powerful because when you get there, sorry, when you get there, you might find something like port 80 being open, which is a big no-no, or something that is more nuanced like TLS 1.2 or dependencies on external services, which are not trusted. So it's very important to perform infrastructure security validation so that you know how your infrastructure looks like and also how it should look like after a deployment. Eventually, we talked about all of these nice things, but it's very important to have a dynamic application security testing suite in place because anything can be disguised, anything can be you know, manipulated and, and uh, prevented from flagging. But if you don't test while you run, and those tools will obviously be very special, you know, specific and specialistic uh, to make sure that they analyze memory patterns, et cetera, you'll not be able to identify whether your vulnerabilities are actually running. It's extremely important and it's interesting from a developer perspective because they perform memory analysis. So anything that might seem innocuous, you might see that when it's running, uh, it will have some patterns which show risks. And it's extremely important to run these as often as possible. So it should not be a penetration testing once a year, but it should be something that's more structured and repeated as part of your CI CD. Any question? It's been a lot. I talked a lot. I showed a few things. Is there any question at all? We got roughly 12 minutes for question. Feel free to write them into the, the Q&A uh, window. I'll keep it open here for a couple of minutes. Another question, but I would uphold OPA as a great way for telephone configuration best practices. Yes, absolutely. And if you look at, <clears throat> sorry, if you look at Defender for Cloud, underneath there is a number of things that will happen on telephone scanning and so on. So I would strongly recommend to look into it. It is definitely a great way. And it's very important that those tools are popping up because infrastructure has often been overlooked by developers as, oh, it's just infrastructure, whilst the reality is that there's so much that can happen over there, and it's extremely important to actually have them front and center so that they are addressed as soon as possible. I will completely agree with that. There's a message in the chat. Okay, someone about my problems earlier. All right, so if there's no more questions, I will thank you very much, all of you, for your time. I wish you a great weekend. I hope to be in touch with you and see you at any of the other conferences. Cheers all.